Lee Edelman begins his next paragraph <clears throat> as follows. Quote, choosing to stand as many of us do, outside the cycles of reproduction, choosing to stand as we also do by the side of those living and dying each day with the complication of AIDS. We know the deception of the societal lie that endlessly looks toward a future whose promise is always a day away. We can tell ourselves with that with patience, with work, with generous contributions to lobbying groups, or generous participation in activist groups, or generous doses of political savvy and electoral sophistication, the future will hold a place for us. A place at the political table that won't have to come, as it were, at the cost of our place in the bed or the bar or the baths. But there are no queers in that future, as there can be no future for queers. The future is kid stuff, reborn each day to postpone the encounter with the gap, the void, the emptiness that gapes like a grave from within the lifeless mechanism that animates the subject by spinning the gossamer web of the social reality within which that subject lives. In other words, <clears throat> this is a Lacanian point that Edelman is drawing from here, that, um, that in some sense the future as a myth, the future as, as a norm that must constantly be sort of reproduced, often in association with images of children and concerns about children, um, it's a myth, and a, it's a myth that must be reborn and reproduced each day, so as to sort of um, keep at bay the kind of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the kind of void of meaninglessness upon which right our culture has has built its systems of norms, its institutions, and and whatnot. Um, that's what he calls the gossamer web of the social reality within which that subject lives. That in order for subjects to live in the symbolic order, what we need to keep at bay is that the symbolic order is not actually a, a natural condition. It's one that's been invented. And what is natural is, in some sense, the void, is, is meaninglessness, is the world as flux and change, right? <clears throat> or I think what Lacan later calls the real. I might be wrong about that, though. Anyway, Edelman continues. <clears throat> if the fate of the queer is to figure, that is, to stand in for, the fate that cuts the thread of futurity, the excess enjoyment, if the excess, excess enjoyment by which we, the queer, are defined, would destroy the other, fetishistic, identity-confirming, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, jouissance through which the social order congeals around the rituals of its own reproduction, then the only oppositional status to which our queerness can properly lead us depends on our taking seriously the place of the death drive as which we figure, and insisting against the cult of the child and the political culture it supports, that we do not intend a new politics, a better society, a brighter future, since all of these fantasies reproduce the past through displacement in the form of the future by construing futurity itself as merely a form of reproduction. Instead, we choose not to choose the child as image of the imaginary past, what we once were, or as identificatory link to the symbolic future. The child as, right, as a promise of, of um, an adulthood to come that will carry on the traditions of what we stand for. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That thus, what is, what is queerest about us, queerest within us, and queerest despite us, is our willingness to insist that the future stops here." End quote. Okay, so um, 
Both passages from Edelman, the one that I closed the last video with and the one that I'm opening this video with, are theoretically dense. Um, that's what you get when you you're dealing with someone who's, who's drawing a lot of his theoretical vocabulary from Jacques Lacan. Um, but one reason I'm <clears throat> sort of introducing you to it is to give you um, give you a bit of, of a variety of ways, right, in which queer theorists and critics um, are addressing the work that they do, right, and insisting that the work that they do is not just about the interpretation of literature, but it that there is a kind of cultural cultural work being done, right, often a political and ethical work being done, and that. Hafey's version of it in her article on Mrs. Dalloway, which is mostly just a kind of um, direct reading of a work of literature, right, kind of direct literary criticism, or whether it's Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, with, uh, who is, is sort of folding together rich analysis, um, uh, theoretical um, um, development or, um, or conceptualizations of ideas, with um, close readings of texts, which she does later in her book, um, whether it's Hafey, whether it's Sedgwick, whether it's Warner in Berlin to develop this idea, right? This is sort of this um, thing that's analogous to patriarchy called heteronormativity, um, <clears throat> or whether it's Edelman, who, who at I don't want to say one end of the spectrum because that makes it sound like queer studies is like one continuum, right? When really it's a it's a it's a much, much vaster um, array of projects. Um, uh, Edelman, nevertheless, kind of stand. We can think of him as a representative of a, of, of a radical opposition to heteronormativity or to what he's calling the symbolic order, and even to what he's calling he aligns with that futurity, right? A hope for a better future. He's arguing that that very hope is part of um, that ideology of, of heteronor, which he doesn't really call it an ideology, but is part of that system, we might say, of heteronormativity. So um, anyway, I just wanted to give you a kind of variety of ways and of projects and of ways in which queer activists, theorists, and critics um, engage uh, with what they do, okay, or, or pursue those projects. Um, often when I, I teach Edelman's texts, um, I'm not technically teaching those texts in this class, um, one, one, students often respond with a kind of, with surprise, right? Um, that he seems somewhat hy hy hyperbolic and, and maybe a little bit too radical, right? What would it mean to live a life that is in, in complete opposition to any future project? Or what would it mean to engage politically in a society in such a way that you're not actually offering any kind of counter model? Uh, uh, counter model? What would it mean to practice a life um, um, or to organize a life um, or to even experiment with a life in such a way that there is no concern for achieving a kind of better setting in the future, right? Um, <clears throat> to that, to that, to those questions, I don't so much defend Edelman as I try to paint a picture of the condition, the cultural condition in which we find ourselves and against which Edelman is is writing, and. The first, so the, about over a year ago, the first time I, I taught this course, there was uh, a funny sketch on the Colbert Report, right? Um, I'm sure you all know what I'm um, talking about. A uh, show, uh, sort of uh, 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 satire news show, that's a satirical news show on uh, Comedy Central. Anyway, it, it was a, a show taking place around Halloween, and uh, Stephen Colbert and Tom Hanks together hosted a, a kind of fake Halloween safety um, demonstration, right? Uh, Tom Hanks is, I can't really quote it, but he's, he's, he's uh, giving, giving advice. It's obvious there's some other reason they're doing this. And, um, and as he's giving safety advice for children, um, they're standing in front, they're standing in front of a, a, a prop door that's been set up in a prop living room. 
and there's a knock on the door. And you every and every time they're opening it to give candy out, a child or a uh, yeah a kid dressed as one of Tom Hanks's characters from various Tom Hanks movies comes through the door. Right, so you get the an astronaut from Apollo thirteen. You get the guy who is stranded. Um, what is that? Um, I'm completely blanking on the name of that film, but anyway, he's he's lo- he's deserted on a on a on an island and has the volleyball. He names Wilson. You know what I mean? Um, you get uh, Forrest Gump, even uh, all this sort of stuff. But anyway, as more and more characters are coming to the door. Um, Stephen Colbert slowly, slowly begins to sense that this is less about Halloween safety and more about just promoting and celebrating the career of Tom Hanks, that that's really the subtext of this whole skit. And he, he tries to call Tom Hanks on it and slowly Tom Hanks is like, oh yeah, okay. Um, uh, we need to stop this skit then, uh, before you, before you get, um, before everybody else figures it out. And there's one final knock on the door and <clears throat> Tom Hanks stands in front of it and says, oh, no, no one's there. Uh, but eventually Colbert opens it, and uh, um, who is it? Matt Damon, I think, comes through the door dressed as his character from Saving Private Ryan, right? And Tom Hanks kicks him out and all this sort of stuff and promotes his movie Cloud Atlas, in which he played like five or six different characters, right? So anyway, I'm talking about this because it's it's interesting, right? That in a skit that is all about the safety of children over Halloween, that is about celebrating the career of Tom Hanks, um, about celebrating the purported diversity of the number of roles he's played, as well as the diversity of the roles he's playing in the movie Cloud Atlas. What's so interesting is that we can kind of laugh and snicker at the idea of a child dressed up as an astronaut um, uh, paying homage to a movie in which an astronaut you know, astronaut and his team almost die in space, cold space, where no one will hear them. Um, it's easy for us to imagine and laugh at a child dressed up as a, as a shipwreck survivor. It's easy for us to imagine a child paying homage to a character that is maybe in one way or another um, uh, mentally uh, abnormal, although I use that word delicately, let's say mentally counter-normative, right? And Forrest Gump, uh, or underdeveloped, who knows what what words we might want to use to describe him. Um, it's easier for us, even though it was Matt Damon dressed as a soldier and not a child, it would even be easier for us to imagine a child dressed up as a soldier, right? Going around trick-or-treating. Um, as Wilfred Owen says, right? Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, or as he's quoting Horace, it's easy for us to imagine those things, right? Because those are all things that as a culture we can, those are all futures that we can imagine for children right? as, as they become adults. But note that there's a role that Tom Hanks once played that he was recognized for. He won an Academy Award for Best Actor for this role. And it was a role in the film Philadelphia. Philadelphia in which he um, played someone, right, who um, uh, contracted and and died uh, from uh, HIV that later developed into AIDS. Right? Note that note how note the aversion that many of you may feel, right, at the idea or at the heuristic or at the hypothetical idea of a child walking through that door dressed up as Tom Hanks's character from that film. And the way in which it would disrupt and rupture the whole tone of that skit. How impossible it probably is, even for the most progressive Steve, of Stephen, uh, member of Stephen Colbert's audience, to imagine a child who might want to pay homage to that role as opposed to these others. That's a structure of understanding that Warner and Berlant are talking about. That's the limits, right, and the safety nets of the symbolic order that Edelman is talking about and against which 
he wants to push. Right? And it's precisely the kind of limitation, it's precisely the kind of um, precisely the kind of limitation, precisely the kind of um, uh, boundary of our imagination that queer studies is attempting to disclose and also attempting to show, uh, also attempting to um, uh, uh, reimagine by finding spaces and finding energies within texts, within media, within um, other materials that might help us find ways to trespass, subvert, uh, or reorganize those borders of what we think imaginable or doable um, or pleasurable for that matter. Okay. So, so that's for those who may think that Edelman's idea may seem a bit too radical. Um, uh, uh, but maybe not, right? Maybe not. Um, at the very least, it's worth thinking about the different sorts of temporality that emerge, that emerge in the texts and the thinkers I've, I've talked about so far, right? Different transvaluations of what we might mean by the future or what hap happily ever after might mean for us. Hafey, you will recall, right, focuses less on the future, although she mentions the future at the end and more on the temporality of just moments, right? Not developments, but moments. Moments like the moment of a kiss. And the way in which that moment can continue to operate as, as what we might think of as, or what she calls, rather. I should probably just look at what she, she calls it. Um, an opening, as a perpetual openings to a future that is not yet decided. So for her, the future, is more about a kind of unknown potentiality than it is about a reproduction of the present, right? Um, for heteronormativity, the kind that War Warner and Berlant talk about, the future is that which must reproduce and secure the present, right? A future present, a future that may be more advanced, but in some sense is a, a conservation of the way things are now, right? In Edelman, we see, as that uh, passage I read at the beginning of this video indicates, an abandonment, in some sense, for all hope of the future, that any kind of attempt to transvalue or refigure the future um, makes one complicit in the very system, the very system that um, a queer politics um, is seeking to undermine and subvert from the get-go. This point is kind of like Toral Moy's um, critique of Elaine Showalter, which I talked about in the last lecture series, right? In which um, uh, the limits of Elaine Showalter's ability to read, read Wolf, according to Moy, um, demonstrates a complicity of some modes of feminist thinking and politics with the very patriarchy they're attempting, again, to undermine, subvert, critique, or attack. But what, but just as with Toral Moy, it's difficult to imagine what a politics grounded on a, a kind of perpetual deconstruction of the categories masculine and feminine might look like, especially in the world where it's still pretty urgent to try to um, establish equal rights or equal practices or uh, at the very least some modicum of justice um, in how, how states and in how um, nations um, and in how cultures organize themselves and their, the identities of their populations. Um, just as it's hard to imagine what that kind of third wave politics might look like. Likewise with Edelman, it's hard to imagine what that kind of politics, which does away completely with the future might look like. Okay. Um, and yet nevertheless, I think it's important to index um, the urgency and frustration the anger and the intensity of Edelman. It's important to index that and hold it, hold it for a while, um, and to keep it in our mind, even when we read um, uh, works of queer criticism that seem less urgent, like that of Hafey, and to remember that um, the queer, 
that forms a thread of continuity between Edelman and Sedgwick, Warner and Berlant, and Hafey um, is an important one. Um, is an important one to keep in mind, right? As we as we try to understand um, understand what this mode of criticism actually attempts to do, what it might look like, and whether or not, right, we as readers um, can find affinities and sympathies um, in those practices. Okay. So I hope that's clear. I, you'll note I haven't really scripted uh, this lecture series at all, um, but if there are questions or concerns or objections to um, my own analyses or my own summaries or descriptions um, or explications of these, of these thinkers, um, uh, please, please let me know ASAP and I'll try to remedy that either in our last class on Tuesday via email or maybe in another video, a sort of, sort of postscript to this series. So anyway, in the next video, I'm going to spend some time in the pages of Sedgwick's tendencies, move us away from Edelman, Edelman, not so much because I think Sedgwick offers us a way to kind of oppose Edelman, but I think Edelman and the intensity of his argument and position um, should be kind of kept in mind. But Cedric will help uh, help lead us back toward um, the concerns with uh, reading and concerns with um, uh, concerns with the way in which queer studies tries to unpack sexuality. So that's not so much a marker of identity of who I am, but something that's far um, far messier, far more provisional. Um, and far less coherent uh, than heteronormativity um, uh, or systems or structures or institutions of heteronormativity might suggest. Okay. Um, I promise we're getting back to the literature. Uh, and in the last video, we'll go, turn to the pages of Mrs. Dalloway and think, think about what, what all of this stuff that I'm talking about um, might help us learn to see in those pages.